Excellent. So I'm going to be talking about uh, about using machine learning for uh, for improving error messages. So very much in the same uh, spirit as the as the previous talk. So here here is where I'm coming from. I love type systems, and I really 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 like those type systems where I don't have to write down any types at all, and there's just a whole bunch of global inference and everything works just fine. But sometimes, as you and I know, this love is kind of a one-way street. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you've been sort of programming in OCaml for like 15 years or 20 years or whatever it is, I've forgotten how old I am, then it's not so bad. But imagine that you are a novice, okay? So you've just heard about these wonderful type systems. Maybe you have to take a, a, a class on uh, functional programming and so on. And in this class, you are given this very simple question, write a little function that adds up all the elements of a list. Okay, perfectly simple question. Here's the kind of program a beginner might write. Okay, the starry-eyed novice would say, okay, here we go. Um, I'm going to sum up with the list. I have the list X's. I match X's with the empty list. Somehow I've written, the, this is the empty list over here. And otherwise, if it's a head Y followed by Y's, I do Y plus some list of Y's. Okay, so now you and I are like, yes, yes, obviously this program is wrong. Well, here's what happens. OCaml says, sorry, I don't like your program. There is a type error, and the type error is at this particular line. How dare you call some list with the argument Y's? Um, I was expecting to see an integer over here, but you know, it, it's all wrong, right? So this expression has the type list, but I needed something that was off type int. Now, you and I, maybe, we've been programming in OCaml for a while. We know, just like pay no attention to the compiler, it's almost always wrong. But the poor novice is like, we're just gonna go back and write JavaScript, okay? We're gonna head over to the gradual typing session like so many of our colleagues, and we just, you know, we like forget about the type system. Um, so let's see, how would an expert instead sort of approach this problem? This is what they would do, right? They would say, oh my friend, clearly you didn't mean to put a list over there because you know, you're trying to return an integer as an output, and so really what you want to do is to replace that expression with something that's an integer. And at this point, the, the novice is like, ah, yes, of course, I get it. I should have put a zero over there. Now the compiler is happy and, you know, and we win, right? So the goal of this work is can we somehow take an expert and put this expert inside a box, okay? So instead of having to you know, pay for expensive TAs and professors and so on and so forth who have learned the hard way through 15 years of expertise, 10,000 hours, whatever your favorite metaphor is, can we put this expert inside a box? And this is a kind of broad problem. It's not limited just to the OCaml type system. Uh, as we saw in the previous talk, you essentially want to do the same thing for any sort of program analysis. Uh, you know, whether one, it works with types or with sets or with data log or program logics, what have you, right? Can you return error messages like an expert would? Now here's the catch. The trouble is, as we saw in this one example and, and even in the previous talk, that trying to pinpoint exactly where the error is is kind of a fuzzy question. Okay, so if we return to this particular example, each of those three locations is a plausible error location. Maybe I meant to put a cons operator instead of a plus. Maybe I shouldn't have called some list and I just wanted to return something else. And of course, the real error which we know, you and I know, is we should have replaced the, the empty list with like zero or something, okay? So you might imagine various heuristics that look at you know, what the type system does, that look at what the individual program analysis does, and assign various kinds of costs to, I think this is the simplest possible Occam's razor explanation, or that one is the simplest possible explanation. And in fact, over the last you know, uh, four or five years, there have been a bunch of very cool papers uh, applying various kinds of very sophisticated logic and uh, AI techniques to do this sort of thing, right? Trying to rank the, the best location based on some notion of simplicity or cost. But unfortunately, all of these systems are still pretty far from expert. In fact, uh, several of these systems uh, in fact, the, the state of the art, which is, uh, I would say, Sherlock from uh, Zhang and Myers, and perhaps even Chen and Erwig, will in fact return either the plus or the sum list call and not the right, not the, not the empty list for the example that I showed you, right? And in fact, there's going to be two other talks on this subject on Friday, so I'm, I'm giving you a little plug for somebody else's talk. Uh, you should go and see those for why this is a really hard problem, okay, for Sheng Chen's talk. Okay, so now let me tell you what is our, you know, what is, what is our approach. So here's what we're going to do is we want to somehow learn over time to pinpoint the error locations better. So what do I mean by that? My view is that we should not think of this business of reporting errors as a one-off thing. It's not like you write a program, you get an error message, and you go home. Instead, really, programming is a conversation. So you start off with the starry-eyed programmer. They write that program. The compiler says, smack, I don't like it. The programmer thinks for a while, they write another program, compiler says, sorry, don't like this one either, and so on and so forth until the programmer finally, quote unquote, gets it right, okay? 
Now at this point, if you look at these entire sort of interaction traces, this conversation, if you look at the sort of bad program and then its nearest fixed version, that's a very strong signal for where the real error was, right? So if we started with this program down there, which was bad, and then sort of further down the line, we found this program, we said, aha, they replaced it with zero. Well, that's a very strong signal for where the actual error location is. And so the goal of this work is, can we design better algorithms for localizing blame by using these fixes? Okay, so can we improve these sort of blame localizing algorithms by training classifiers that are trained on using these code fixes, okay? So what I'm going to now explain over the rest of the rest of the talk is this pipeline. So how do we start with fixes? How do we transform these fixes into getting better classifiers? And then do these classifiers in fact produce better blame results? So let's first start with fixes. And I've kind of explained this already, right? So what is a fix? A fix for us is simply a pair of a bad and a fixed program. Okay, so it's uh, the nearest sort of correct program that we got after it. Now the standard thing one might think of is, well, why don't we train on like GitHub or uh, you know, uh, other sort of version control repositories. Well, those are too coarse grained because you really shouldn't be committing ill type programs to GitHub. That's somehow, that's not right. You shouldn't like break the build or whatever, right? So instead, what we did is we just tweaked the OCaml compiler so that it would be like in a Big Brother 1984E style recording all the conversations. Okay, so in our, in our, in our undergrad PL class, we rigged the compiler so it's just like all the students, every time they type anything to OCaml, bang, we just record it. Okay, so we have these very detailed conversation traces. And now we can just match up pairs of good and bad programs by matching each bad program with its nearest sort of fixed version after doing some data cleaning, right? If you erase the file and paste in a brand new file that you copied from your friend, that's probably not a fix. Um, so we sort of, you know, we, we remove outliers of that sort. Okay, good. Now how do we go from fixes to classifiers? And here we're in a bit of a pickle because what we want to do is, you know, we don't want to like, reinvent the sort of decades worth of work in machine learning. We want to use kind of off-the-shelf algorithms for machine learning, what is called supervised learning. But the problem is that all these algorithms, they don't work with programs. They certainly don't work with OCaml programs. They all require vectors of numbers. So now if you are in the business of recognizing cat pictures, a vector of numbers is very easy to get by, right? You just read off the pixel values. Or if you're trying to recognize audio, you have, a, you know, you have various sort of numeric signals. But what is a vector that you could possibly get from, from an ML program or for, from a program, okay? Now, of course, you know, you could be like, well, why don't we write the program out to disk? It's gonna be a series of zeros and ones and that would be a vector. But that's probably not gonna be very helpful for machine learning because all the semantic structure of the program is lost, okay? So how do we get some semantic structure in there? Well, here's, our, here's the one sort of key technical idea in this paper is this notion of a bag of abstract terms. Here's the idea, okay? So I'm gonna take the program and I'm going to represent it as a bunch of vectors where each vector corresponds to a single subterm or a single node in the abstract syntax tree. So here's the idea. Here are, the, here are several different nodes in the abstract syntax tree or subterms. And so I'm going to have one vector for each of these terms. Okay? Now what are the actual numbers that we're going to put in? Well, here's the clever bit. I can make up whatever predicate or function I like over individual AST terms. Right? You make up whatever function you like. I don't really care. And that function is going to give me a feature. So here are some examples. I might use syntactic features. Is the node a nil node? Is the node a plus node? Okay, so for example, this, this blue fellow gets a one because it is in fact an empty list node. Uh, in this case, the green fellow gets a one because it is in fact a plus node, right? Purely syntactic. I can do better things. I can have contextual features. For example, was I an argument in a function call, right? So this y is an argument inside a function call. So one over there, these other two things are zero. I can make up other nodes which capture typing information. Was the type of this expression a list, or was it an int, or was it a whatever you like, right? So here, for example, the blue and the yellow are one and one because, because they, in fact, uh, have the type list. Uh, we might, maybe size is important. Size might be important because, well, we want to somehow bias the fix to smaller sub-expressions. Those might be simpler explanations, so you might have size as a feature, and so on and so forth, right? We found one particular feature to be extremely important. This is what is called the type error slice. Think of it simply as, if you have a type error, what is the subset of locations that somehow participate in the type error? Okay, so obviously there have been, a, there have been several papers on this subject, but at a very high level, it's just what is the subset, the slice of the program sub-expressions that actually have anything at all to do with the type error, okay? So in this case, for example, the nil and the plus belong in the slice, while this yellow fellow, the y's, does not belong in the slice, so we can just like throw it away. Excellent. Finally, the last thing we need is a label that tells us, well, was this node actually part of the fix? 
So in this case, we know that the, the user uh, changed the nil to, the, to, to a zero, and so I'm going to label this, this blue circle, the blue circle vector with, uh, with one, and everybody else is zero, okay? So excellent. With these bag of abstract terms, what I've done is I've taken your fixed program, which was an AST with lots of semantic structure, and blown it down into a bunch of vectors, all of which have the kind of information we might want. And you can just keep making up more and more features. When we started this project, we had no idea what the relevant features would be. But the great thing about unsupervised learning, uh, sorry, about supervised learning, is that you don't need to know what the right features are. Just like keep pouring them in like a bucket and see what sticks. Okay, so here we go. So now how do we get from vectors to classifiers? So those of you who know even any machine learning will know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm not one of those people, so let me just explain uh, how this step works uh, very rapidly. So here's how supervised learning works. You have a bunch of vectors. And in these vectors, you have a bunch of features that are called input features. So think of it as the stuff you know. And then there's the output, which is the label, in which in our case is, was this the node that was fixed? Okay? And the goal of supervised learning is to what in the PL world we call synthesize a function that maps the input features whose values are known to the value of the output label. Okay? So there are any number of sort of off-the-shelf algorithms for doing this. And what we're going to do is, uh, we're going to sort of take some of these algorithms ranked from sort of ease of use and produce very simple functions to produce very, very fancy functions uh, that are harder to use but, you know, are, are more complicated to actually understand. Excellent. So the first of these is what is called linear regression. Raise your hands if you've heard of linear regression. How many people here? Okay, fair, fair number. I'm, I'm like the only dude who doesn't really know what linear regression is. Um, then there's decision trees and forests, which give you a kind of decision diagram. For example, if the, you know, if the x feature is, is 1, then return this value, else return that value. So you can sort of create a branching program like that. And finally, you have the new hotness, which is, uh, you know, as you know, Canada is kind of the, the center for this deep learning, right? Uh, you have uh, neural networks. And I'm just, you know, th there's various technical details. So specifically, we use something called a multilayer perceptron. And MLP10 is like a skinny multilayer, is, is a not so deep network. And the MLP500 is, is a more sophisticated one with like 500 inner nodes, right? The, the, the exact details are not super important unless you're really into that sort of thing. Okay, so what we're going to do is we already have our bag of features. We have these various different supervised learning algorithms. And now what, how do I actually produce the blame? Here's what I do. Given a particular user program, given an ill-type program that the novice types out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run my classifier on all the sub-expressions in that, in that particular program and return the ones with the k highest values for the fixed label. Okay, so it's up to you to pick the threshold. Maybe you want to return the one highest, or the two highest, or the three highest, and beyond three is like, come on, we may as well just use the OCaml error message at that point, right? But anyway, it's parameterized by how many, how many locations you want to return. Excellent, so that's the high level architecture. And now let's see how well this does, okay? So you sort of bundle all that stuff up. We call it NATE, uh, which is in fact a bona fide acronym, Numerical Analysis of Type Errors. The, the real reason we picked it is we wanted to name it after a person because the previous tools have been called things like Sherlock and Mycroft and so on and so forth. So I'll let you figure out who NATE is, and it is not Nate Foster from Cornell. Um, sorry, that's an inside joke. Okay, so here we go. Um, let's see, how well does NATE actually work? Is it any good, or is OCaml, in fact, pretty, pretty good to start with, right? So the, this is probably the project that I've spent the most time on, uh, because we started it in like four years ago, uh, you know, writing the IRBs and so on. So over two years, we, uh, we, we curated this data set of about 5,000 program fixed pairs. We, we instrumented our compiler. We, we have, you know, one of the great things about CS enrollments booming is that you have a lot of students who are, who are writing OCaml programs. Now we have, you know, we recorded like 50,000 interaction traces. We have 5,000 program fixed pairs. And these are the kinds of programs you would write in an introductory FP class. So there's, you know, lots of recursion, higher order functions, algebraic data types, and so on and so forth, right? Um, we have like almost 300 different features. As I said, we didn't know which the right features were. We just like making, kept making stuff up. Several syntax, context type, and so on. And we tried four or five different classifiers, right? So now as far as evaluation is concerned, we really want to just answer the following well, four questions, but I'll talk about three in this, in this talk. Is Nate actually accurate, or shall we just use the compiler? Is, is it at all useful to do any of this stuff? If it is accurate, which features does, are actually useful? And the third question is, yes, yes, you produce better error locations, but are they actually useful? You know, does it actually help in comprehension? So first, is it accurate? So what we're going to do is we're going to measure sort of top K accuracy, where we give you one of the top K terms, where K is one, two, or three. And, you know, there's detailed graphs in the paper, but here's the high-level bit. 
This is NATE, these are the five NATE classifiers, logistic regression, tree forest, and the two fancy neural networks. And this is the kind of state of the art. This is uh, Sherlock from Andrew Myers and his student Dan Feng Zhang. And long story short, in fact, NATE does pretty shockingly well. Okay, so here we are, and again, NATE knows nothing about the type system beyond just these vectors of numbers, right? Um, NATE says, NATE gets it right just with top one, 72% of the time versus Sherlock's 56. And there's a star there, and I can explain why that's there uh, later. And if you look at the top three locations, then Nate basically gets it right nine out of 10 times, okay? Um, what features does Nate actually find useful? As it turns out, the single most biggest bang for the buck is this business of error slicing. Because that already takes your program, which is, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, whatever lines, and whittles it down to like five lines or, or something, right? Some relatively small number. None of these results that we have would be at all useful if we didn't have slicing, because it literally gives us a 25% bump uh, in our accuracy. In fact, and here I find, this I find to be a surprising result, if you just take the slice, and then you pick randomly from that slice, and you pick two locations at random from that slice, you do better than Okamo. Okay, so if you do nothing, you just take the slice and pick randomly for two locations, one of those two is gonna be the right location, and that's better than Okamo. Now to be fair, Okamo just returns one location. Okay, uh, let me skip this because I don't want to talk about it. Types are important here, I already said that. Um, and finally, our you know, a better error message is actually useful. Well, so we did a user study, Now, take this with a big pinch of salt, because you know, I'm kind of, I don't really like this part so much, but we did do a user study, so I should talk about it. So we rounded up 31 undergraduates at the University of Virginia, and we took sort of three of our programs, and what we did is, for each program, we gave them, here's the error message OCaml gives, and here's the error message that Nate produces, right? The, the different locations, otherwise the programs are the same, and they were sort of distributed randomly, so a student did not know whether they got Nate or the other thing. So this was literally in a printed exam. Uh, and long story short, we found, and then we had sort of external graders evaluate. So the students were asked, can you explain what the error is and can you fix the error? And then we had a bunch of independent ex external graders grade whether the students got the explanations and the fixes right and wrong. And you know, the kind of the thing on the tin is that the students explain and fix up to 25% better. So there's lots of details in the paper on why you shouldn't believe this. Um, but nevertheless, there's some evidence to suggest that better error messages are in fact helpful. So, long story short, data is actually pretty good. You can imagine using various clever algorithms, as you know, all of the other tools do, Sherlock, uh, Mycroft is another one that uses MaxSat, it's very clever. But nevertheless, if you just instead use this data, you, you can get far more accurate results. Um, slicing is pretty crucial. And finally, there's some, you know, there's more details on this in the paper. It's quite interesting when you look at some of the predictions that Nate makes, and then you look into why it made those predictions, so you have to kind of stare at the models, and this is where the simpler models are easier. Nobody can understand what an MLP is doing. Uh, but a linear classifier, or the decision trees are actually reasonably easy to read. We find that they sort of learn what you and I know to be typing rules. Okay, so that's kind of, um, you know, if you're worried about the singularity, now you should be. Okay, here are a few caveats. Um, I personally, you know, I'm kind of a statistic skeptic, but nevertheless, you know, I, I, should, I should tell you why, why you have to, you know, take, take all this with a pinch of salt, right? So there are two big biases that's, uh, that are in our work. Is Nate actually useful outside UCSD? Maybe it only works for the programs that we use in CSE 130. Maybe, that's entirely possible. Uh, on the plus side, one of the things we did do is that we, so the, the evaluation numbers that I showed you, they were taking data from one year, training the classifier, and using them on another year. Right? And that alone is actually, so all the numbers that I quoted, 90%, 75%, et cetera, they were all like that, right? So at least we have evidence to suggest that in one particular class, uh, you can get pretty, pretty accurate results. But nevertheless, the whole generalization, overfitting, that's a general problem with machine learning. The second issue is, is our notion of fix actually accurate? Maybe, you know, is this like the real, is that actually the real fix? Well, I mean, so that, that's something you have to kind of uh, keep in mind. So, long story short, uh, I told you about our goal, which was to improve uh, the error, error messages by specifically pointing to the right location instead of some location that, is, that produces an inconsistent type. The way we do it is that we essentially record in the compiler all the sort of long interaction traces, we convert those into a bunch of fixes, we convert those fixes into a bunch of vectors with features and the fix label, and then train classifiers, and then use those classifiers to assign blame. And that gives you pretty good results. Um, I hope I'm not out of time. It's all good, Joshua says it's all good. So thank you, and I will take questions.